Dr. Robidino, welcome to uh, the journey. And um, I know we've we've known each other for uh, uh, a lot of years now, and you've not only uh, treated me as well as uh, I think I'm pretty sure everybody, uh, at least in my immediate family, uh, yeah. you, you and uh, <laughs> Dr. Renee have have treated every everybody in the fam in the Polky family at, at one time or another. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let me just tell you just a little bit about what the journey is, and then we'll kind of jump into uh, into uh, into you. Um, the journey is essentially um, uh, ordinary individuals coming on and telling either their their own stories of how they may have transformed throughout life through setbacks or how they failed forward if there was some kind of obstacle that has uh, occurred in their life, or just maybe they started off in one direction in their life and then um, you know there was something that happened or, or or something didn't happen and then they pivoted and then they recreated themselves going in another direction so it's really about those stories of transformation and change and what we do when obstacles um, happen in our life and obviously right now with everything that's been going on the last 10 weeks uh, it's uh, it's been uh, even more important to, to be able to talk about those stories of, of transformation okay. and change so Absolutely. so uh, so welcome and maybe Thank before you. we get uh, too far into it if you could maybe what is what does dr. what does dr. Rob do for fun when he has an opportunity <laughs> to have fun <laughs> that's a great question so um, uh, well, where to start? Um, so I've been married, uh, it'll be 20 years in December. Uh, I met my wife in chiropractic school. So she's a big, a big source for fun for me. So um, we typically in a non COVID world, we like, we like going on dates, we like going out to dinner, uh, hanging out with friends, going to movies. Uh, but we we enjoy just like spending time on the couch like watching a netflix series that's kind of fun too sure sure um and then together we have two boys uh jake is going to be 18 uh coming up here on the 21st of may wow. and then josh uh my youngest son just turned uh 15 may 1st and then renee and i both have birthdays in may so usually may is a big festival for us uh and so both of my kids are uh, musically inclined. Uh, my youngest son plays piano, um, and he's also really big into theater. So you and I have made some of those theatrical connections together. Yep. yep. And, um, and then my oldest son uh, is a really good uh, guitar player, and um, so in our free time, we just we like playing together and just uh, playing music together. I play bass and guitar, and so. Um, so I really, I really feel that, um, that music for me is an emotional, uh, outlet. Music is, um, is very sacred to me and, uh, expressing myself through music or hearing music in different emotional states that I have, uh, can really help, uh, either nurture my psyche or just bring out creativity in different ways uh, and can just really help me relax mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. so I would say that's a, a big part of me nice nice I uh, I, I, I don't play music don't play any particular instruments um, but I have uh, I have a, an interest in music and definitely know how uh, how much that can influence my mood um, yeah. And then based upon what mu music I choose will really enhance that um, or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. So I, or I can yeah. change it based upon, a, I also uh, enjoy um, the stories that are told through song. Absolutely. And sometimes lyrical or sometimes it's, it's through, um, uh, through just the, the, the beat or how the music's uh, composed uh, can very much also shift me into a, a different state of consciousness or, a, or at least a different uh, mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no, there's no question that, you know, that music is inherently ingrained in us. I mean, that's why you see these little, these little toddlers, like when they hear music, man, they just start, they just start moving they just start like dancing and it's it's really inherent and ingrained in them to to move their bodies and to feel that response when they hear music it's it's just the coolest thing 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it is, it is, it is fun before, before they start thinking uh, too much about how they appear and how they look. There's just a freedom that happens with that. And uh, so, and I, and I, if I remember correctly, at one time, I think you told me the story that you also enjoy dancing. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Um, so my, um, my, uh, my whole family's from Ecuador, from South America. And so, uh, so when I was little, um, we would have, we would have, I, I guess, strange parties for most Americans, uh, because for us, our party started at like 10 PM and they usually started at 10 PM with dinner, eating, eating super late. Uh, and then, you know, for Christmas, for example, we would, uh, we would open up gifts at midnight mm -hmm. and then stay up until three or four o'clock in the morning, just, just dancing. And, um, so it's kind of a funny story. When Renee first saw me, uh, in chiropractic school, I was just like, like dancing and cutting a rug. And she's like, who's that dude? I want to dance with that dude. <laughs> and, um, and it's funny, we met at a Halloween party a couple of weeks um, after that. And um, I was dressed up like a, sort of like a 1970s mafia gangster. <laughs> and uh, she didn't want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> so she was a complete joker. And, but then, uh, yeah, one thing led to another. Gotcha. So, so she, she was attracted to the shy, reserved, introverted uh, Dr. Rob. <laughs> That's right. Right. So, but, you know, I mean, Renee, Renee took some dance in high school and, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for, for women to find dudes who like to like cut a rug and dance and, uh, but she liked that, you know, right. I suppose. And, and um, on our, our first date, actually, I, I brought over like a bunch of um, of um, Gypsy King CDs and a bunch of like Latin dance CDs, and we we just we moved the kitchen table in her um, excuse me the living room table in her apartment it had a nice hardwood floor, and we danced for like four hours. It was just the coolest thing, and um, um, so yeah, I do I do enjoy dancing. Yeah. Uh, so you are well. So you already answered one of my questions. Uh, how? What was the first date that you and uh, <laughs> you and Renee went on? So that was one of the first dates, right? That was one of the first dates. So we um, we we had met a couple times, and we we met in chiropractic school. So um, uh, she was in a higher trimester than I was, um, and so she was, you know, she was a little further ahead with the with the academics in a higher trimester than I was. And so um, that was helpful for me. She, she gave me a lot of pointers, but um, she, um, she invited me over for dinner and she cooked me this like killer uh, salmon. Um, it was so, so good. It, she had wild rice. She made this key lime pie from scratch. I mean, like she pulled out all the stops on this dinner and then like, I pulled out all the dance moves and, <laughs> and then the rest is history. There so, you go. <laughs> so that was one of our first dates. Yeah. Very, very nice. Well, uh, one, one of the things that going back to the idea is though, if I, if I, uh, went over to you, if I was at your house, right. And you guys, and I walked in and you guys were watching a Netflix series, um, what series would I walk in on or, or, what uh, would be one of the series that you most recently watched that kind of like, this was a good one? So we, uh, we loved Ozark yep. uh, with Jason Bateman. Um, Jason Bateman is, a, is an accountant. He's a CPA. Um, he got mixed up with the wrong people, ended up um, uh, laundering money for a, a drug cartel dealer in Mexico. And uh, it was really kind of a... Um, uh, twisted dark dark uh, drama but it's a it's a great series and yeah. really really entertaining so just given our profession you know after a hard day's work um you know we like to we like to escape in different in different ways and 
like seeing something something dramatic like that it just helps us uh kind of you know wind down so sure. uh so ozark's pretty good um another one that we're watching is uh <clears throat> is uh dead to me okay yeah and that's uh uh that's a uh, uh also another drama about a gal who loses her husband um and um befriends a woman that uh really turned out to be part of um part of her issue why her husband's dead um mm -hmm. she ended up hitting her husband on a on a hit and run accident and she befriends the main character and uh and that's also a kind of a a, a crazy twisted drama interesting okay have yeah. you guys seen have you guys seen outer banks yet uh we have we yeah. have that's really good too yeah, yeah, that was kind of falls in the same kind of line. Uh, a yep. little bit of darkness and and some yep. some of the other other aspects that that go into that. A little bit of little national treasure treasure hunt aspect of that. Yeah. Yep. So, so uh, let, if you could tell us how did uh, how how did you get called into being a chiropractor? What's uh, how did that come about? Because obviously that's where the Robin Renee story began. But you had made the decision to go in chiropractic before you met uh, Renee. So what? Yep. So how, why, uh, why chiropractic? Why chiropractic. So it's, it's really a great story and I, I love to tell it. Um, my dad, my dad was a respiratory therapist growing up. And so, uh, he worked in a hospital, um, in Evanston. I grew up, uh, in Evanston. So he worked in St. Francis hospital. So we, my younger brother and older sister, we used to come to the hospital to hang out with my dad until his shift was over. And, um, and then he would later take us home. My mom uh, was a, a school teacher from the Chicago Public Schools. She's retired now. And uh, so we used to walk uh, from our school, hang out with my dad for a little bit. But I was always fascinated by the, uh, by the doctors and the hustle and bustle. And, and um, you know, I got my first stitches in that hospital and had my first, you know, hospital admit into that hospital. And, and so it was really fascinating. Um, my dad was also like really into yoga and reflexology and just um, macrobiotics, like a lot of holistic stuff that didn't really fit with medicine, but it was fascinating. Um, a big part of that was, um, was our neighbor was diagnosed with stage four uh, lung cancer when I was probably around 10. And um, he went to go see this medical doctor in Evanston. His name was Dr. Block. And Dr. Block put him on this crazy macrobiotic diet. And uh, a lot of um, movie stars now do macrobiotics. I think Gwyneth Paltrow did it. Um, Madonna did it. And um, um, it was a very, very strict uh, regimented diet. And... Um, <clears throat> our neighbor was able to live much, much longer, even with stage four lung cancer, mm. like through that diet and through some other um, traditional medical practices to help him um, live out his life. And he lived for a long time after that. It was really cool to see. Mm. And um, so our parents were like, whoa, we got to do this. So at the age of, at the age of 10, all of us went on this like insane macrobiotic diet. So it was so, it was so detail oriented. We had to chew our food so much that, you know, as you know, Kevin, food um, starts in, in the mouth with digestion, right? You start right, yeah. chewing your food. That's where you break down the food. We had to chew our food so much that the food was almost liquid by the time it passed through our esophagus and um, we started digesting so that our stomach would have less um, work to do while it was digesting. And so we would just sit at the dinner table and chew and chew and chew and chew. And then it was also recommended that we, um, we'd swish around our liquids so that it almost became solid. So dinner time took us, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. It took two hours to prepare every day. It was so much for my mom. I don't know how she did it with three kids. Um, but you see like in our school photos, first, second, you know, third, fourth grade, and then 
you see where we have that like that change from our diet and you can really see the market difference in in hair color in skin texture our eyes were very vibrant and so at a, at a young age i learned um i learned how important diet was i also learned a lot about um, acupressure because my dad was reading all these books on acupressure and um it was funny i just saw a patient today who was having um some really severe menstrual cramps and i told her this story that i would read all of my dad's books on uh, acupuncture uh, and acupressure and there's certain spots that if you if you hit those spots you can actually relieve menstrual cramps so i started to do this in high school uh and it was <laughs> it was i was like oh i'm gonna you know meet some girls through this through this uh reflexology technique and it's true i met tons of girls but um uh it was always more of a of a like friendly helpful way than it was like hey i want to go out with you kind of thing so um so i got really interested in that and so i thought i wanted to be a medical doctor so i did a lot of volunteer at hospitals um and um i realized that there were certain things about traditional medicine that I, I didn't like. I wanted to be very intrapersonal with my patients. I wanted to like know their names and I wanted to know their families. I wanted to know like what brought them inspiration. I wanted to know who they were. And I just, I didn't see that interaction so much um, in the emergency room that I worked in. So I looked into all different forms of healthcare. I looked into, um, acupuncture, I looked into osteopathy, I looked into nursing, and, and I looked into chiropractic, and chiropractic just made the most sense to me as how a person should live um, with an understanding that the world um, is just beautifully created, and the world is designed in a specific way, as our bodies are designed in a specific way. And so if you understand how the body's designed, you can really understand how it's healing. Mm -hmm. And so it really made sense to me how to, um, to look at the body from a holistic perspective, really from rather than a mechanistic perspective. And I just mm -hmm. fell in love with chiropractic. Mm -hmm. So got adjusted met my wife there and then here we are almost 20 years later sure 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 and and now you guys have uh have your own place how, how long have you had you guys had your own place uh health first wellness uh, so we uh we started uh in 2008 with um with a, a partner uh dr scott schiestel uh who started health first in the late 90s and uh, we, grant, we grew uh, a, a great partnership, and um, he eventually uh, decided to get married, move out of town, and sold us the business. Wow, so, okay. so, yeah, it's been, it's been great. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, there's a couple things that you touched on, and that, so it makes, in, in most chiropractors that I've, you know, worked with, I, I started seeing a chiropractor. I believe I was in ninth grade um, was the first time I went to a chiropractor and it actually was yeah. because I had a, an injury in wrestling. Um, I had been in, you know, in a, in a, in a, you know, whatever position and, you know, the, the typical pinched nerve in my neck. Uh, um, and, and so I went to a chiropractor and within, well, w with less than a week, I was able to wrestle, um, you know, wrestle the match that I was, you know, that I was supposed to wrestle in. So I didn't lose any, lose any time, so to speak, on the mat of, of any significance. Um, but the way that I felt when I was in that pain, you would have thought that I was going to be um, out for a while. Let's put it that way. Um, and that, and I think that was the beginning of me uh, believing in how chiropractic care can help. And that was my shift from using uh, a medication to treat the symptoms and, and moving into how can I uh, work with someone who's going to um, maybe look at fixing the problem. Sure. And, uh, and that was the beginning of that, even though I probably didn't fully grasp that concept of, of, of fixing the symptom versus the problem, but that was definitely the first introduction. And then 
I think, you know, I can't remember exactly what year it was, um, probably about six years ago or so that, that, I, that I came to you. And I've been seeing chiropractors my entire life, different chiropractors and different styles. And, but I think even though my experience with chiropractors had always been that aspect of lifestyle, yeah. um, but there always, there, there seemed to be a tendency, maybe you can speak to this. Um, there seemed to be a tendency. So I'm going to say this to put it out there and then I want, but, yeah. but I know how you and Renee. I've heard it all, man. So yeah. I've heard it all. <laughs> it, it, it seems similar to sometimes medical doctors is that they have one hammer and then they're, you know, turning everything into that type of nail. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and constantly trying to, you know, okay, this is what I have and everything. And I have a, I have a, a round hole. So everything's going to go in that round hole and I just got a hammer to make it, make that happen. And then when, right. I, when I came to you, when I was switching, um, even though there was definitely some impingement um, with some subluxation, um, but it, the origin of it was more muscular than it was uh, spinal. And, sure. and we started working from that and, 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 and working with the soft tissue, but then also elements of recognizing there was elements of my lifestyle, even though I was, I thought pretty healthy, there was imbalances going on that were causing part of my difficulty. Um, so, so maybe speak a little bit about that. Yeah. That, uh, that some of the stereotypes, but they're stereotypes because they came from a reason Sure, sure. Well, uh, and I think I think the stereo, you know, the stereotypes there for a reason because um, as as a chiropractor, like my number one go to, it it will always be to adjust. It will always always be to adjust. Um, um, it's 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 the best thing that I do. It really is. Um, unfortunately. Uh, for what the patient comes in, what the patient wants, uh, sometimes it always doesn't match with the adjustment. So for example, if a patient wants maybe more range of motion in their neck and you adjust them, right? And you know, the, the misalignment's gone, but they still don't have range of motion in, the, in their neck. And then what, do you, then what do you do, right? So you have to look at other things. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't know this coming out of chiropractic school, but through a lot of seminars that we do um, and through just life experiences, I learned that there's, um, there, there's, just, there's just more. Sometimes the brain isn't talking to the body um, and you need to work on the brain a little bit more. You know, of course, chiropractic is a big part of the brain, but sometimes you have to retrain the brain in a with a certain exercise or, or a certain movement to tell the brain like, hey, you're not hurting, do this movement, it's okay. And then the brain says, oh yeah, I get it, we can do it, right? Sort of like if you have a pebble in your shoe and you're on a hike and that pebble is always there and you finally just get tired of that pebble, you take the pebble out, but your brain is still gonna think that pebble's in the shoe for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of exercise and work through that for your brain to say, hey, the pebble's gone. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's brain and then sometimes it's soft tissue. So, um, so you can adjust and, you know, as a profession, chiropractors are amazing at that. Uh, sometimes you need to look at the soft tissue a little bit and say, hey, maybe something is trapped in the, in the, and the fascia or the, the tendons, the ligaments, the joints, the muscles. Sometimes we need to work at that too. So, so we have a massage therapist that, that works here also at Health First and she works a, lo a lot of the, the muscular problems, the myofascial problems. And sometimes we need to work together uh, to, to say, hey, let's work on this so that we can free up some of the fascia or some of the muscles so that I can get in there and move things around a little bit or vice versa. Um, you know, she'll say, hey, maybe, um, maybe if we work on this person, you can adjust them easier. Or if you can adjust this person easier, I'll be able to work on the muscles better. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a, a, a symbiotic relationship too. Um, but as the, as the doctor, we need to stand back and say, hey, you know, 
the, the, the adjustment is working. It will always work. We'll always take rid of, get rid of nerve pressure. But sometimes a person, maybe an athlete wants to, uh, wants to snatch better, um, wants to deadlift more. And so we have to retrain those neuromechanical um, um, routes up to the brain so that the body can work as well as it was designed to work. Sure, sure. Uh, and, I, and I know in my own personal experience, that definitely has been the case. And especially after going through uh, uh, an injury that was prolonged, um, though it, it did eventually get better without surgery, um, there was a lot of effort that went into that. Um, yeah. but there was that, my, my, as you said, my brain remembered uh, where yeah. that pain, pain area was and, um, and, and that I really needed to be able to, through movement, uh, through stance, through structure, I needed to uh, uh, help my brain remember how, you know, where we're at, that, that movement. I know most recently, um, in the last, well, since January, my wife bought me a, a gift certificate for uh, like four sessions doing Pilates. And <laughs> You can you can just imagine the look on my face. Oh man, right? yeah. With, like, happy, thank you, but no, thank you. <laughs> happy happy birthday, Kevin. Yeah. You know, yeah. former bodybuilder, powerlifter. Right. You know, uh, thinking he was a tough guy, right? And and then I get a Pilates. Uh, yeah. You know, and um and so I, I I got it in November. Didn't actually go until the middle of January. And within the first whatever hour that I was there, I could already tell that there was some uh, relief. It made sense to me. That's and, huge. Yeah. And, um, and then each week progressively, um, similar to the myofascia massage that is, similar to the type of work that I've done with you over the years, it, it, it clicked with me, made sense, and then I could practice at home some of the things. That's um, great. To improve yep. in between. Yep. And so, and I, I, I think it's funny because, uh, <clears throat> Some, for some reason, you know, men are very scared of like Pilates. They're scared of yoga. They're scared of certain movements. But, uh, but those those movements, they're 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 so important because, you know, as we as we age, we start um, we start getting maybe a little bit more stiffer. We have to work a little bit harder at keeping our mobility and our range of motion, especially after forty. Right? Things start changing. We we need glasses to now read um you know up close um and uh but man i applaud you for 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 doing it and once you start doing it you're like ah this is not so bad i can move a little bit better and i'm a little freer uh with my motion and with my movements and then you get some endorphin rushes and and it's it's just pilates is great yoga is great it's uh it's good movement for you and i think probably for me one of the things that I appreciated about chiropractic initially when I was doing it. And, and this, again, this is my bias, right? Probably goes along with being, you know, a social worker and doing psychotherapy is that it, it allowed me to be an active participant in my own healing and recovery. Right. And so, so that I could, um, it, it would, a lot of times traditional medicine is very, not that I have anything, I don't have anything against traditional medicine, but there, I felt there was a tendency for me to be in more of a passive role and in, in with either with chiropractic, with, uh, you know, stretching or meditation or the Pilates or doing myofascial massage, all those things, I was taking more of an active role. And then in between sessions, I had certain things that I could work with. And I know for me, that is always good for me. Um, that the more that I can be involved in my own healing, um, I, I just, I, I feel stronger versus pass for me, passively waiting for something to change. Yeah. So that's, that's huge. That's huge. And, uh, it's, it's, it's so important that you see that connection that like, Hey, this is my body, right? I own this. Right. And I have, uh, I have a chance to to take part in my own health and and own uh, basically own your body and say, hey, this is me. Like I have a responsibility to myself to do these things, to work out, to eat well, to drink water, um, and 
to, you know, to wake up early to invigorate myself with movement, right? That's, that's, you know, that's a choice. And the people who find those choices um, and, and take part in them so that they can empower themselves to live better is huge. It's just huge. And I think you're starting to see some of the fruits of your labor for all these years and in doing all those things, having a routine mentally, having a routine physically, having a routine socially. Uh, there's so much more to, to people than this, um, than this shell that we are. We, you know, we're spiritual beings, we're emotional beings, we're, we're physical beings. And, and making all of that um, come together in, in, in a daily routine that you do just helps you become more whole. Mm -hmm. yeah it's huge you know and, and that kind of you know kind of segues into what i wanted to touch on with you next right is, is and and i and i definitely you know i started lifting weights and and being involved you know i started playing organized sports when i was in grade school but it probably really was really went to a different level when i was in middle school you know um and i and that's when i started lifting weights when i was 11 um in middle school so so I guess that would make it 40 years that I've been lifting weights and and, yeah. and it's it's changed and some of the things that worked at one time for me to have success and allow me to be successful in my given activities then later became part of the problem because of those imbalances um, you know being a bodybuilder it was about appearance versus um, versus looks it was it was it was yeah. uh, it was about strength and appearance um less and and less to do with functionality and uh, because sure. when you were that strong it appeared that you were functional <laughs> you sure. know but it was the reality was now looking back at especially over the years is that i was strong in certain movements but you throw me into different movements as i got older with it i wasn't as strong as it was um the farther I got away from football and wrestling um, and, and doing those type of contact and combat sports, I didn't, I didn't continue growing and getting stronger, except in these, um, in the, in these, they weren't stationary movements, but in these particular movements and, and then the imbalance came and that's where the injuries came um, because of the muscle imbalance. And I think yeah. the thing that I appreciated appreciate about you as well as uh, Renee and a host uh, and a handful of other people that I work with right now is that inevitably I learn something every time I go in and see you. That's awesome. About me, you know, yes. about, about my body. And then, and then it's up to me if I'm going to take that, what I learn and that insight, if I'm going to then turn it into part of my routine. Sure. Um, and, and so as I mentioned, you know, for, since I've been young, I continued with that exercise routine of, if not daily, um, multiple times a week. And then I've added into it different things. So when something like uh, the COVID pandemic uh, comes in, um, it would, it, I, I chose not to change my morning routine. I'm still getting up at 530. I'm just not going to, to peak fitness and working out. Sure. I'm, I'm doing a workout at home especially after I recognized that this thing wasn't going to end after 14 days. <laughs> sure. I figured out, all right, I got to, I got to figure something out. Sure. Um, and so I am so grateful that I had already been practicing that daily routine. And, and, you know, regardless if it was working out of the house, if it was uh, those types of things, what would you say for individuals that may not ha have been consistent with doing those daily routines and that structure that you talked about being important, what would be some tips that you would give regarding um, a routine, um, uh, movement? What what would be some tips you would give them? So yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, my wife and I have been talking a lot about this because um, uh, it it seems that from what we're hearing from some of our patients is that you know, they're not, some of them are not working. And so they're actually snacking more. And because they're snacking more and there may be more sedentary, they're eating more. And so we've been joking around that, uh, that it's, we're calling this the COVID-15, <laughs> like, like, the, like the freshman 15, because they, they see that they're not as active and, and they're, they're eating more because they're not as active and they're, they're at home. 
And so um, some, some people have been complaining that they've been eating more, but, but if, if people are used to working out daily, um, if, they can, if they can find a way to just work out with body movements, um, so not having you know, a dumbbell or a rowing machine or kettlebells or um, barbells to lift, um, any type of uh, mobility bands, those type of things. But you could just use your body. So there's a, a great website called um, hotelwad.com. So it's hotel, W-O-D, so which stands for workout of the day. And um, this whole site was designed around either working out in your hotel room if you travel um, or working out in a hotel exercise facility that doesn't really have a lot of gadgets, not a lot of barbells or kettlebells, maybe just a, a physio ball and a treadmill, and that's all you got. So um, you're able to see workouts that you can ramp up your heart rate and use some great um, movements to, to get some movement and keep your, your routine going throughout the day without having to use uh, expensive exercising machines. Uh, so that's, that's a great tip. Um, but, you know, drinking plenty of water throughout the day to, to flush toxins. As the weather's starting to get better, um, going outside is huge. We know that, um, that the virus doesn't live outside very much. And so um, making sure that we, we take uh, vitamin D, which we don't really have very much during the winter uh, and fall, but going outside trying to get some vitamin D when it's sunny or taking it orally is a, is a great defensive mechanism for the virus. Um, uh, <clears throat> vitamin C is great to take. Um, of course, if you wanna get that from your food, then just look, look for foods that are high in vitamin C, strawberries, oranges are great. Um, getting plenty of rest. Uh, a lot of people, they don't get a lot of sleep, but since they've been at, um, at home a little bit more, people are getting more sleep. I know that I don't have to uh, wake my kids up as early because I don't have to take them to school. So they get to sleep in a little bit more. I get to sleep in, in a little bit more. And um, I've definitely felt better with a little extra sleep. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things where I guess just things that you know that you should be doing to kind of focus on that and, and hit it a little bit um, is always a great thing for health. And, you know, and I, I agree with you from the full body workouts. I just, just recently brought some equipment from, uh, from my, uh, my, my closed wellness center that I had at the, at the, at my one office. And, um, but prior to that, all I was doing was, um, I had an old, one of those contraptions, I don't know, probably got off QVC that you can hook in the door jam to do pull-ups. Oh, and right. so I was doing pull-ups and push-ups and deep knee bends and some ab work and lower ab work, core work. And that was all I was doing for about six weeks. And it wasn't, and, um, but I was doing it initially. I, I just got into just, okay, this is what I can do. So it was 10 minute workouts. And, but they were pretty intense 10 minute workouts doing pretty, you know, cycling yep. pretty quickly through that. And then now I've worked up to 20 minute workouts that are also going pretty high intensity. And, um, and it's interesting. It went from surprisingly, it went from maintaining to actually now seeing some changes and some gains. And, um, and uh, we'll we'll see if the gyms ever open up again. We'll we'll see uh, if I decide to go back, or maybe I'll just uh, continue this uh, <laughs> yeah. the way that I've been doing. It, I don't know. Uh, yeah, for sure. There is an element that I do like seeing. Uh, you know, I like having the variety of choices that I have there. But I know that's one of the things, and that's where I'm going to kind of ask you uh, a couple more things here. Is it's definitely one of the things that have been one of the gifts that have come out of this chaos has been. Um, uh, breaking some of the myths of, um, well, what would I do if I can't go to the gym? Well, I couldn't go to the gym and I figured it out and uh, you figured out how to, how to work out there. What, go, were you going to say something? No, no, go ahead. Just what, so if you, um, if you were going to address this idea of 
a, a lot of what's been going on with 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 this time period has been fear of the unknown. And yeah. there's been a lot of this element of us not knowing what's going on. We, obviously, we know more. The scientists and the research um, know more now than we did 10 weeks ago about, about COVID. But this idea of, of not knowing what we don't know. I mean, at the beginning of this 10 weeks ago, um, it seemed to be there was a percentage of people that felt that the need to hoard toilet paper. And, and, right. and because that was, a, that was a way of addressing that, that fear, that concern, or bottled water, or, or whatever. Right. What, what would be, what, what is your thought from a, from a Dr. Rob's perspective, or from a chiropractic perspective, and lifestyle, regarding this idea that when I, I don't know what's going on in this, and the fear of, uh, the fear of not knowing what's next, what's happening, or not being able to control when the shelter is going to end, all these things. What would be something that you would suggest, or what would be something that how how does how does how does Rob deal with that? So I I love um, I think in a fearful position, right in a in a scared um, environment. The best thing that you can do is just um, is just dig into into knowledge. So try, you know, if this were if this were a war with human beings, you would want to, I guess, try and find as much out about your enemy as possible, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's what the scientists are doing. They're trying to um, discover like what this virus is, what it does, how it attacks people. Um, how it affects people with with these comorbidities, right? Um, and so that's that's what they're doing. So I, when this thing started, um, my staple website uh, was the uh, was the Johns Hopkins website that showed the numbers of you know how many cases were found in Illinois, how many cases were found in New York, how many cases were found in California, you know. Um, how many cases were found in Ecuador where, you know, where my family's from. And so I, I was on that thing every day looking at, looking at the numbers, looking at the cases. Um, and so uh, just getting as much information. So I guess that's just one. And then the second thing is to just understand the fear response, right? And so you know, being in business uh, for this long and going through chiropractic school and taking boards and all of these things, Renee and I, um, we understand fear. Like we understand fear. And we've definitely failed in so many, you know, different ways. But if, if at the end of the day, if you can pick yourself up and learn from your mistakes and your failures and, and I tell my kids this, like if you can face fear and look at it and understand what that emotional charge is about the fear, like why are you scared, right? And look at it um, to understand it um, in a way you can embrace the fear so that you're not feeling paralyzed by it, right? And so I guess, you know, knowledge is, is one of the best things for me to figure out. Um, and then understanding what that emotional response, response is in myself personally, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's important. And then I guess the third, the third thing is, is to just maybe act in, um, act in a stance of love and compassion rather than fear, right? So um, I, uh, I love, I love this, this analogy that I, I've just been kind of messing around with this in my, in my head, that in the 1970s, there was Woodstock, right? All these people, all these people got together because they were, um, they were understanding that the times were, were difficult, right? Uh, a lot of people were protesting the Vietnam War at the time. There was chaos. There was, you know, uh, you know, Kent State. All of these things were happening with our country. Our country was divided. Um, 
uh, people didn't trust politicians at the time. And it was just, it was just this craziness. And these, this little farm in New York decided to have this concert. And people flocked from all over the country because they wanted to go see this concert. They wanted to, they wanted to laugh a little bit and love a little bit through music. And so they gathered and there were just tens of thousands of people that gathered for this, for this festival in New York. And it was really, it was, a, it was a festival to basically show love and support for humankind. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's the bottom line of Woodstock in celebration of music, right? Mm-hmm. So I may be a little closet hippie, but, um, <laughs> but if you can show love and compassion with people these days, I think that's the most important thing to show. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, that last piece about showing um, love and kindness, right? And, and being able to, um, if, if I have an attitude of being open to giving love and kindness, right? If I'm open to that possibility, that is going to be the antidote vaccine um, to fear. Because I'm not yeah. going to be fearful if I'm loving. Sure. I may be, I think it's important for it to be respectful, right? I need to be, I need to respect the, 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 the electric fence. I don't have to fear the electric fence. I need sure. to be respectful of, of what the virus can do and, and how the impact it can have. But I don't know if I necessarily need to be fearful. I, I remember um, in the early 90s when I was an addiction counselor and HIV and AIDS were coming on and yeah. all the misinformation that was about that one we didn't have the information yeah. but sure but, but what we did through the grapevine was so much worse um and the the stigma and the stereotypes and the fear uh, yeah. that if you were standing next to someone who w- was uh, a drug addict or a, a homosexual they automatically well they may not even have a, they have the virus let alone uh have have aids that you know and but there was this not knowing in the fear and and i don't necessarily think this is the same thing but i think it's similar well aids is a virus yeah right aids is a virus and we didn't we didn't know a lot about it in the 80s and 90s and and so if if you know if you had a, a friend or a, a relative that was homosexual, you didn't, you were afraid to touch them. And it, right. it really, it really isolated, um, it really isolated people um, either who were, you know, intravenous drug users or because it, it put people in a category. And I mean, the, the information about the virus is, um, it's so huge now. Look at like Magic Johnson. He's been living with, you know, with AIDS for so long, and and uh, he's living his life, man. He's doing he's doing great. Yeah. Um, I've got you know I've got patients who, um, uh, who have the have the virus and and uh, and I just I just love on them and I just hug them and and it and it it's so good to have that mutual um, respect for your fellow human beings that like, you know, you can love on them and hug them and, and, uh, and there's, you know, there's no fear. And so it breaks down the barriers uh, to people. And, and it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a great thing. Yeah. And I think that has been over time, over centuries. I mean, at one time, you know, and obviously I'm going to be a miss a lot in between, right? But I mean, at one time, uh, if you had leprosy, there was all these fears of how you would get it. And then people were ostracized to, to a colony where they could only be. And, but you would see these individuals that would go and take care of the lepers. And, but most importantly, besides treating them physically, they showed them love and kindness. Yeah. And so, and physical touch and they didn't get leprosy as a result of it because that's a myth too similar to the aids and similar to um what we'll probably in time find out um about this as well um so so two more things what has rob learned about rob that he wouldn't have if this wouldn't have happened 
Sure. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I think, um, you know, definitely uh, I've been scared too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's been, it's been, it's been scary for me. Um, you know, both of my parents, um, uh, you know, are, are elderly and they're, they're high risk. You know, it, it makes me scared for my, um, for my, for my parents, um, for my patients, my coworkers, all of us. But it, I think it, it's really helped me to, um, to know that when there's a, a pandemic like this is when like your staff, your friends, your patients, man, they, they need you more than ever. Like they need your, they need your calmness. Mm -hmm. They need your leadership. They need your love. They need your compassion. They need your understanding. And uh, if you don't have that right away, sometimes you have to project that image before mm -hmm. uh, you got to you kind of fake it till you make it right. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you're scared, the best thing that you can do is like understand that fear and control that fear. Um, but if I never would have had that, that situation um, early on with the pandemic, I wouldn't have understood that about myself. It was like, now is the time to, you know, you really have to be, um, you really have to be compassionate and loving and understand people where they're at, no matter, no matter where they're at and just love them. That's yeah. really, that's really the biggest thing I think that I learned through this. Yeah. Well, and I think, you you know it it is if you <laughs> what you just said rob if you've been doing it 12 months out of the year for the last 20 years when this crisis comes it may cause us to pause but your normal is to continue doing that yeah that's your normal and to not yeah. do it is going to be disruptive sure so uh so you know we we it, my i used to have a coach that says kevin how you practice is how you're going to play. Sure. How, how you're going to practice on the practice field is how you're going to, how you're going to play on Friday. I didn't like the fact that he was right, but the truth was, is he was right. <laughs> you know? sure. um, and, and I think we have to practice because we don't know when we're going to get called in and we don't yeah. know when we're going to get called up. And I think it's uh, seeing how you interact with your, your patients. Uh, I get, I, I enjoy watching uh, <laughs> as I, as I, as I wait uh, for my turn. Yeah. Uh, and I've really yeah. enjoyed that. So uh, you and, and Renee, you guys do a phenomenal job. Um, living the lifestyle um, as, as that loving and being kind and being um, healers uh, to the individuals that you interact with. So I appreciate uh, what you guys are doing for, for me and my family, as well as the community as a whole. Um, so Rob, if there was one thing you wanted to leave with today, you know, for the audience, what would be one thing you'd want them to take away? So I, I guess just, it's it's really it's more the love, man. Just uh, um, just uh, love on your family, love on the community, um, love on your life because you just get you just get one time around. And so um, so the more compassion and the more love that you can share with your fellow human beings, because um, we are all in this together. And uh, you know we're uh, we're rotating around the sun. You know. Um, super super fast i don't know how fast but super super fast <laughs> yeah. and 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 we're all you know we're all human beings and so um just by uh by showing each other love and compassion um uh can can really speak um to people when they when they know it there's um there's this great great story i don't know whose story it was and and uh whose it belongs to but um, there's this great story of um, uh, of a man uh, in New York, and he's on the subway, right? And um, and uh, he's just sitting there, and he's like deep in thought, and he's he's just kind of uh, kind of sulking a little bit, and his three kids are just running amok in the subway, and um, everyone's just getting annoyed with him, 
And um, finally a lady like stands up and she says, you know, you should really calm your kids down and tell them to sit and be quiet. And he just, you know, he just sighs and he says, I'm so sorry. Um, we're just coming back from um, their mother's funeral. She, uh, she had passed away and I guess the kids are at odds with themselves and each other and they don't, they don't really know how to act, right? And the woman was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I had no idea. And so I guess, you know, with all this going on, Kevin, is nobody really knows like what's going on in, in the mind or the psyche or the soul or the heart of someone else. Sure. Um, you don't really know what's happening, but just to, to give people love and compassion wherever they're at um, will really, I guess, really, uh, you know, make the world a better place. So that's all I got, man. Yeah, uh, I think that um, is perfect, and um, <laughs> and and I think if we can just take that and and practice at that, um, when it's opportunity with someone in the subway or or something like that, maybe we'll be able to step up and uh, be able to do the right thing. So, yeah. Rob. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Um, awesome. For everyone who's listening, uh, Dr. Rob and Dr. Renee Adino at Health First Wellness, um, uh, they will uh, help you get back uh, aligned. Uh, and, uh, and if nothing else, uh, you'll get aligned and you'll have a good laugh and you know that you are, are seen there. So uh, I do appreciate everything you do. All right, Rob, awesome. we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bye -bye. Kevin.